Hello, my name is Dawson Kearns and I'm a PhD student in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology at the University of Tennessee. My research involves investigating mechanisms and genes responsible for resistance to VIP3A, which is a type of insecticidal protein that is produced in Bt crops. Bt crops have been genetically modified to produce insecticidal proteins that originate from the genes of a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, today, there's a wide variety of different Bt proteins available that target different groups of insects. Uh, the most popular ones are the Cry1, Cry2, and VIP3 proteins that target caterpillar pests in corn and cotton, such as corn borers, corn earworm, or bollworm, and fall armyworm. Uh, there's also the Bt proteins that target beetles in corn, such as the Cry3 proteins and the Cry34 and 35 proteins. And then there's the most recent Bt trait, which is Cry51, which is active on thrips and plant bugs and cotton. And so uh, most Bt crops today actually express multiple Bt traits that target the same insect, which is a way of managing resistance, and it can provide better protection against that pest. And uh, today, the majority of the corn and cotton grown in the US contain a Bt trait, and it's often used alongside with other GMO traits, such as herbicide uh, resistance traits. So now that we've established what Bt crops are, Let's take a look at what they can do. So for example, here are some images of BT cotton next to non-BT cotton. And I think it's pretty easy to tell which cotton had the BT trait and which one didn't. And so now that we've seen what BT can do, uh, let's take a look at how it works. Uh, so first, Bt proteins need to be eaten by the insect. Then upon entering the insect's gut, they're processed by enzymes from an inactive form into an active toxin, which is then able to bind to receptors on the insect's gut, where upon binding, it's able to form pores in the insect's gut, which eventually leads to the death of the insect. However, uh, some insects are more tolerant to Bt proteins than others. For example, bollworm and fall armyworm were difficult to manage with the first Bt crops uh, that were released on the market uh, because these crops only produced single Bt proteins such as Cry1A or Cry1F, uh, which didn't have as much activity on bollworm and fall armyworm compared to other pests is really only until later when Cry2A and most recently VIP3A were added that we have seen really good protection from these pests. Uh, however, it's important to remember that Bt proteins are still very valuable even if they don't work on every single pest. Corn borer is a great example of this where we see a substantial reduction in percent stock damage uh, and Bt corn, regardless of whether we use two or three Bt traits. Uh, however, with corn earworm, we see the benefit of a reduction of damaged kernels with two Bt traits, uh, but we still see the greatest benefit when we add the VIP trait. Uh, so even though some of the traits are less valuable for corn earworm management, uh, they're still very good for managing other pests. So although corn earworm is a pest on corn, it really gives us the most trouble on cotton, which is why it's called both corn earworm and bollworm. And so uh, the reason we saw that the two gene corn was not working as well as the corn that had the third gene for VIP is because this pest has developed resistance to the Cry1 and Cry2 proteins available in two gene BT crops. Uh, so this is partially because we had already selected for resistance to Cry1, 
by the time that Cry 2 was added to BT crops. So we never really had more than one BT protein with good activity against corn earworm at one time. So we never really had a BT pyramid for this pest. Uh, another contributing factor is that both BT corn and BT cotton have similar BT proteins. Uh, so corn earworm gets selected for resistance uh, to BT cotton as it feeds on corn earlier in the growing season. And so uh, because of this, supplemental insecticides are sometimes needed for cotton that does not have the VIP trait. Uh, the benefits of these supplementary insecticidal treatments are apparent when we look at field trials conducted across the Mid-South. Uh, the x-axis shows different BT cotton traits available and the ones marked with a red X do not contain the VIP trait. And if we look at the far left box, uh, that box doesn't have any BT trait at all and gets the largest increase in yield. Uh, but the other non-VIP traits also see a greater uh, boost in yield than the VIP traits after insecticide treatment. And if we look at the reduction in fruit damage by each trait, we also see that the VIP traits have a greater reduction in damage than the non-VIP traits. Uh, and we also have uh, some resistance monitoring data uh, from the lab to back up uh, why we're seeing this increased damage on BT crops without the VIP trait. Uh, resistance assays conducted at Texas A&M, which involved feeding BT proteins to larvae collected from field populations in the Mid-South, which includes Tennessee, uh, show that almost all of the populations tested took more than 10 times as much protein to kill uh, than a susceptible population for all of the cry proteins. Uh, and so we see a general increase in uh, the percent of populations that are over 10 times resistant uh, from 2016 to 2021. Uh, however, none of the surveyed populations tested over uh, 10 times resistant to VIP. Uh, so VIP appears to still uh, be effective. Uh, however, even though no resistant populations were detected, uh, they were able to isolate resistant individuals from the field in Texas and make a colony uh, that was more than 588 times as resistant to VIP uh, than a susceptible population. And so uh, my research involves studying this resistant population to determine the mechanism that makes it resistant and the gene for resistance, which will allow us to determine how prevalent uh, this gene currently is in the field. Uh, BT resistance typically manifests in one of two ways. Uh, the first way is that processing of protein into its active form could be disrupted, uh, which could result in resistance to a wide range of BT proteins uh, because the same enzymes are involved in activating uh, different types of BT proteins. Uh, however, we've never seen this type of resistance in the field. It's only been observed in laboratory populations. And typically, it only results in minor resistance, uh, which probably isn't enough to actually make a difference in the field. Uh, the other mechanism of resistance that we see is due to the receptor for a BT protein being altered so that the protein can no longer bind. Uh, this gives the insect resistance that targets a specific BT protein. Uh, and this is mostly what we've historically seen in field resistant populations. And it typically results in very high levels of resistance, uh, like what we're seeing in the uh, field isolated VIP resistant population. Uh, so to determine if resistance is due to reduced binding of VIP in the resistant population, I conducted two different kinds of binding experiments that essentially work the same way. Uh, both methods involve dissecting guts uh, from the larvae and processing them into what are known as brush border membrane vesicles, uh, which is also called BB&V for short. Uh, and these are essentially just balls with uh, the uh, receptors uh, from the insect's gut 
uh, attached to the surface. And so I uh, incubate the uh, BBMV with VIP that has been labeled with either biotin or iodine-125, uh, which is a radioactive isotope. Uh, and then I can tell how much VIP is binding to the receptors uh, from the resistant insects compared to the susceptible insects. And uh, using the iodine-125 is more sensitive than the biotin because uh, it allows us to tell exactly how much toxin is bound, whereas the biotin only allows us to visualize the protein uh, through light emissions, uh, which only kind of gives us a relative amount of how much toxin is bound. Uh, so when I did the binding assay with the biotin labeled VIP, I saw that less signal was emitted from the resistant population samples uh, than the susceptible population, uh, which suggests that there's less VIP binding uh, to receptors in the uh, resistant uh, population. And again, when I did the binding assays with the radio labeled VIP, I also saw uh, a similar thing with the uh, susceptible population binding around three and a half nanograms of VIP, uh, whereas the resistant strain was binding a negligible amount of VIP. Uh, so it's pretty safe to say that the mechanism of resistance is most likely due to lack of VIP binding to targeted receptors in the uh, resistant strain. Uh, so considering that VIP is the last BT protein that is still reliable against corn earworm, uh, we need to make sure that we practice good resistance management strategies so that we can get the most mileage out of VIP. Uh, so the main two strategies to manage resistance are gene pyramiding, which involves using multiple BT proteins to target different receptors to manage individuals with resistance to one protein. Uh, and then the other is the use of uh, non-BT refuges to provide sorts of unselected susceptible insects that can mate with the resistant insects and dilute out the amount of resistant individuals in a population. Um, unfortunately, as we discussed before, uh, the benefits of pyramiding for corneal worm management are limited due to their already being resistance to the cry proteins. Uh, so the use of refuges is extremely important to uh, prevent resistance. Uh, so, my main takeaways from this talk are that BT resistance in bollworm populations is a major threat to BT cotton, and that selection for VIP resistance will only get worse as BT crops with the VIP uh, trait uh, become more widely used. Uh, corn will also be a major driver of resistance. Uh, it's also very important to be aware of what traits you have in your BT crop because efficacy can vary greatly. And it's also important to make sure that you are in compliance uh, with the refuge requirements for your BT trait. Uh, we need to remain vigilant of larva survival in VIP corn and cotton uh, because resistance can start to develop and spread any day now. Uh, however, I do also have good news. Uh, BT crops are still effective for most targeted pests. And even the traits without VIP are still useful for managing bollworm under many circumstances, uh, especially in cases where uh, pest pressure is low. Uh, VIP resistance hasn't evolved in the field yet on a wide scale, and uh, we'll soon be able to determine the resistance gene from our resistant lab population. And then we can monitor specifically uh, for this gene early on so we can have an early warning of resistance. And last, it looks like VIP resistance will be binding based. So that means it's going to be uh, specific to VIP, uh, which means uh, any future BT traits that are released should still be a viable option. And with that, I would like to thank you all for taking the time to listen to my talk. And if you have any questions, uh, you can reach me at this email.